Hello, my name is Franklin Dana. I'm coming from VCU Health in Richmond, Virginia. I'm going to talk about the supermediastinum and thoracic inlet. I'd like to thank the Society of Thoracic Radiology for inviting me to give this presentation. I have no disclosures. So the thoracic inlet is bounded by osseous structures, specifically the T1 vertebral body posteriorly, the clavicular heads and the nubrium anteriorly and the first ribs on either side. The floor of the superior mediastinum is defined as a plane extending from the angle of Louis posteriorly to the T4-5 disc space. The roof of the superior mediastinum is the thoracic inlet. And these are all of the structures passing through both the thoracic inlet and superior mediastinum. And I will present cases uh, including most of these. So the uh, fascial anatomy of the neck is divided into multiple layers, which extend from the skull base through the entire neck and well under the chest. Uh, this fascia uh, acts as a support structure for the neck. Uh, it's important to note that these fascial layers are not normally visible on CT or MRI, uh, but uh, tend to, given their fibrous nature, uh, restrict and direct pathology, whether infection or malignancy from the neck into the chest or vice versa from the chest up into the neck. So I find the naming system for the cervical fascia to be confusing. Most literature will describe uh, superficial and deep uh, compartments when the deep compartment is then further divided into another superficial, middle or visceral and another deep layer. So for the, this presentation and, and my uh, images are labeled as such. I instead will use the terms investing, pretracheal, and prevertebral for the three layers of the deep cervical fascia. The superficial cervical fascia includes the skin, subcutaneous fat, the external jugular vein, and the platysma muscle. Uh, the first layer of deep cervical fascia is the investing layer surrounding the neck and completely encasing the sternocleidomastoid and trapezius muscles. The next layer is the pretracheal fascia, uh, which surrounds the thyroid gland, the trachea, the esophagus, and the strap muscles. Uh, this is a nice sagittal illustration demonstrating that these fascial uh, planes extend from the skull base through the neck and well into the chest. The pretracheal fascia can be further divided into muscular and uh, visceral components. The posterior wall of the visceral component of the pretracheal fascia is the bucopharyngeal fascia. And this is important because the potential space between the bucopharyngeal and prevertebral fascia is the retropharyngeal space. Again, this is normally a potential space. We don't tend to see this space unless it's filled with pathology. And then finally, the deepest cervical fascial space will be the prevertebral fascia which encloses all of the paraspinal muscles, including the scalene muscle and the vertebral column. Uh, just to mention, the, the carotid sheath is uh, formed by contributions from all three layers of the deep cervical fascia. Again, it extends from the base of the skull well into the chest and contains the common carotid artery, internal jugular vein, and vagus nerve on either side. So an example of a mediastinitis, this patient is recently post-surgical repair of the ascending thoracic aorta with an inner position graft, has gone on to develop uh, mediastinitis involving both the anterior and middle mediastinum. However, the same process then extends superiorly above the uh, plane of the angle of Louis in the T4-5 disc space to also involve the superior mediastinum. Another example, this is a retropharyngeal abscess with a uh, lenticular uh, shaped peripherally enhancing fluid collection extending from C2 through C5 in the retropharyngeal space. This went on to surgical drainage. This MRI was performed after drainage, and now it nicely demonstrates this retropharyngeal abscess extending from C2 through the entire neck, thoracic inlet, supermediastinum, and down to the T6 level. Uh, vascular anomalies at the uh, supermediastinum and thoracic inlet. First of all, the right internal jugular vein tends to be asymmetrically normally larger than the left internal jugular vein. 
uh, aberrant right subclavian artery is very common in some series reported up to uh, as common as one half of 1% of the entire patient population. Uh, acute DVT, in this case of the right internal jugular vein associated with a catheter, uh, the right internal jugular vein is completely thrombosed, no contrast opacification, it's lumen, the wall of the, of the vein is enhancing and there's a surrounding inflammatory response. So this is acute DVT, catheter associated DVT of the right internal jugular vein. Moving on, the thyroid gland uh, will contain uh, nodules, the vast majority of them benign adenomas in uh, up to 8% of the population. Uh, women are more frequently uh, affected than men the risk of an individual thyroid nodule increases if there's a positive family history, um, history of multiple endocrine neoplasia or prior radiotherapy to the neck or chest. And so an example of a large asymmetric heterogeneous uh, left unilateral thyroid mass, this went on to excision. Uh, this mass extends from the neck through the thoracic inlet and into the superior mediastinum, displacing the tracheal air column to the right. This uh, surgically was shown to be a benign asymmetric goiter. Uh, the thyroid gland itself is mildly and homogeneously hyperdense due to its intrinsic iodine content. Again, multinodular goiter will be an enlarged heterogeneous gland containing multiple nodules, cysts, and calcifications. It's important to note that both cancers and adenomas can enhance with contrast. And even more important to note that uh, CT and MR do not reliably distinguish thyroid nodules from thyroid malignancy, or I should say benign thyroid nodules, adenomas from thyroid malignancy. The good news is that the uh, most common thyroid cancer is gonna be a slow growing papillary cancer. And uh, important to remember that most patients will die with the thyroid cancer and not from it. So to help risk stratify patients with thyroid nodules and CT or MRI, we use the Duke criteria. And most importantly, uh, nodules are categorized uh, as uh, suspicious. Uh, if, any, if, uh, if any nodule is pet avid, if the nodule has invasive features or there's regional adenopathy, uh, if a nodule is greater than a centimeter and the patient is less than 35 years of age, this is without a prior study to establish stability where there's a dominant or solitary nodule greater than 15 millimeters in a patient greater than 35 years of age. These will then go on to a thyroid ultrasound referral. Uh, ultrasound uses the TIRAD system from the ACR to again, risk stratify patients uh, to proceed to biopsy. Moving on, the esophagus at the level of the thoracic inlet is squeezed between the hypopharynx and the spine and is normally uh, mildly left at midline. Uh, you can have infection, inflammation, or esophagus involve any segment of it, uh, producing mural thickening, uh, stenosis, and pre-stenotic dilatation. Uh, the vast majority of primary esophageal cancers will be squamous cell carcinomas. Uh, the risk factors are smoking, alcohol, and achalasia. Uh, adenocarcinomas are less common. Uh, they tend to occur more distally in the esophagus than they're associated with gastroesophageal reflux or Barrett's esophagus. An example of a primary squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus uh, superiorly, which is uh, invading through the uh, membranous uh, portion of the trachea, producing a tracheoesophageal fistula. Moving on, the trachea, most common primary neoplasm will be a squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, this is followed uh, by an adenoid cystic carcinoma and less commonly an adenocarcinoma. As in the tracheoesophageal fistula case I just showed, uh, direct extension seems to be the most common presentation we have either from a primary esophageal cancer or a primary lung cancer. Uh, less common will be metastases. Uh, this is a case of tracheal stenosis, again, at the level of the thoracic inlet and superior mediastinum with inflammatory polyps. This was mechanically debrided and resolved spontaneously with uh, steroid therapy. A second case of uh, idiopathic tracheal stenosis. Uh, nothing was done. Uh, this patient was treated with steroids and this resolved spontaneously. 
Moving on, their brachial plexus uh, exits between the anterior and middle scalene muscles and follows the course of the subclavian artery and vein to uh, comprise the neurovascular bundle. Uh, thoracic outlet syndrome can be a compression of nerves, arteries, or vein, uh, and can then be divided as a neurogenic or vascular etiology. Uh, nice cartoon to demonstrate that the roots of the brachial plexus will exit between the anterior and middle scalene, again, to form the neurovascular bundle. A uh, pancos tumor is uh, classically a, a squamous cell bronchogenic carcinoma rising the pulmonary apex that invades through the pleura uh, into the chest wall, uh, ribs, brachial plexus, and spine. And an example of a uh, large heterogeneously enhancing mass, which is centrally necrotic invading the chest wall, ribs, the spine, and the brachial plexus. Uh, a, an interesting case, uh, this is a uh, thoracic inlet lipoma, produces a fair degree of mass effect on the tracheal air column. However, this lesion was uh, asymptomatic and discovered uh, incidentally when a CT scan of the chest was performed for other reasons. This patient is simply followed. And a, uh, a maneuverial chondrosarcoma, a large expansile destructive mass at the thoracic inlet compressing the air column. Uh, CT reformats demonstrate a chondroid matrix internally and uh, corresponding three-dimensional reconstructions. And uh, moving on to uh, additional vascular lesions, I'm a little lateral to the thoracic inlet and supramediastinum. This is really the supraclavicular fossa and upper chest, but this is a large pseudoaneurysm uh, uh, which arises at the proximal anastomosis of an axial femoral uh, bypass graft. And finally, a patient who had a vascular uh, thoracic outlet syndrome and initial MRA demonstrates that her arteries and veins are normal. She's symptomatic on the left-hand side. However, when she raises her left arm and the study is repeated, she has an occlusion of the medial aspect of her left subclavian vein. So this is a vascular etiology of thoracic outlet syndrome. These are my references. And I have four uh, review questions. Question number one, the floor of the superior mediastinum is defined by a line drawn from the angle of Lewy to the T1 vertebral body. True or false? That is false. The floor of the superior mediastinum is defined as a line or a plane drawn from the angle of Lewy to the T4-5 disc space the T1 vertebral body defines the posterior margin of the thoracic inlet. Question number two, the retropharyngeal space is a potential space between the bucopharyngeal and prevertebral fascia, true or false? And that's true. Again, a diagram demonstrating a normal a uh, potential space for the retropharyngeal space extending between the bucopharyngeal and prevertebral fascia from the skull base uh, into the chest. Question number three, CT imaging can reliably distinguish benign from malignant thyroid nodules, true or false? And that is false, CT and MR for that matter does a poor job of differentiating benign and malignant thyroid nodules. Uh, we use the DO criteria uh, to refer patients for thyroid ultrasound, and ultrasound uses the TIRAD system from the ACR to further risk stratify these patients for uh, tissue sampling. We can also do nuclear medicine with I-123 scans and the presence or absence of uh, PET avidity. And finally, question number four, the, most, pri the uh, most primary esophageal cancers are adenocarcinomas, true or false? And that's false. Most primary esophageal cancers are squamous cell carcinomas. Adenocarcinomas tend to be less common, occur distally in the esophagus and are associated with gastroesophageal reflux or Barrett's esophagus. And thank you very much.